Thanks for taking the time. Finally, we, we got it. We did it. My pleasure. My pleasure. My, my schedule is just really busy with work. But everybody's schedule is with running around and, and flying to different countries, different time zones. But you in Slovenia? Yeah, I'm in Slovenia now. I mean, so, you know, we have a one-year-old. Not far from here. I'm in Munich now. Oh, you're in Munich. Oh, okay. Are, are you touring again in Europe now? Or... No, I'm just visiting my family. Okay. We'll be back in May, I think. May, super. Yeah, yeah. I, I saw you toured a lot in November and uh, last year. And uh, Yes, yes, we were very good. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, uh, I wanted to ask you, you know, start this talk. I, I listen to Dance a lot and it's such a beautiful album. And uh, have you been preparing something new as a band? Thank leader? you. Um, I have. We're going to uh, produce some singles. And we're going to start next month to putting putting out things. I don't want to promise with what frequency we're going to do it, but it, it's going to be fairly regular. Mm. And the Ooh. first single is called Lucky. Okay. It's the same band? It will be the same band. We, we will, for every single, invite a different guest. Oh, wow. Fantastic. And then in the end, it will come out as an album, right? I mean, or... Probably because, but you know, people don't like albums so much anymore. We might press a vinyl. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, uh, because people still like to do that. But but CDs, you know, it's since the Apple computer stopped making CD drives, people are very much downloading it. So we're just yeah. gonna put it available for 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 download, and then and you know, we yeah. might. Even make like an EP like when we have fourth I like to investigate in different ways of bringing their music like in more artistic ways so I'm still looking what we should do we did uh, we did single EPs at some point oh really wow okay and, and that might be something we do it's a little bit complicated to make EPs because not everybody presses EPs but um I, I am familiar with it. I loved when we made singles. For the last record, we we, we did, we made singles and then we talked, but we didn't actually press any CDs. I once, a long time ago, pressed CDs for Kindness of Strangers. Mm -hmm. And I had to go to California. I actually went to the place and it was an old CD pressing factory. And the guy was an old man and he was very funny. He showed me all these like, green glow and yellow and pink CDs. He said, this is what I do now. And he, but he said, I used to only do this and shop me the black stuff. And he said that with the blue and the green one, we can still do, you know, you can make them thicker and then they have a yeah. little bit more bass and they sound better. So he was a really, really great guy. But he just had that little factor and he specialized in singles. Wow. But okay. I don't know if he's there anymore. I, I don't think that factory... Uh, exists anymore and, but he was great and he 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 pressed really high quality singles and it was very popular you know mm. but then yeah. um when i lost contact with him i didn't find a new one but you know i think since singles are so popular on the web maybe people like to have singles before but the last one i told that you know when you make records your audience is the people that have an expensive record player and that really yep. collect, you know, kind of blue and all these things. And there is a whole, they're, they're, they're real music lovers. And I love that audience because they'll go to incredible lengths to get an old CD yeah. and a recording. They're, they're really fans. They're not somebody who turns the iPhone on and, and has it as background music, which I don't mind either. I like to have music in my life as the... As a mood setter, or you know, it, it just makes me feel better. Yeah. You know, lately at home with Michael, we've been listening to a lot of classical music. Really? I don't oh, know. Wow. He okay. just, yeah, he's was first very against the iPhone and because you know the digital 
the compensation for musicians is still not settled and he felt robbed by yeah. by when this turnover happened and and his income was a lot less from streaming than it was from sales of cds so he was mad at the whole thing but then he sort of warmed to the idea and he found this uh, thing on iTunes, which was somebody's playlist of classical music that he liked. So in the morning now, we're class listening to classical music from his iPhone through our PA, you know. So the, the next project is going to be like a string quartet with, with you guys or something like that. You know, I'm always um, in favor of that. And that thought has not left my mind to work with strings again. But um, in order to do that live, yeah, yeah that's heavy. Yeah. I'm, it's it's not easy. It, you know, it starts with amplifying it. It can be done, and every time I I love to go to shows of you know singer songwriters oh. do it a lot. When you do it in jazz, you have to collect a bunch of improvising string players, and there's still not a whole lot of them. I mean, yeah. I've performed with a lot of them, and and it's actually I I believe that they play parts. They're very, I love the way they play just, you know, normal string stuff, accompanying uh, pads and things like that. I love because, you know, when they're a good player like Zach Brook or, yeah, yeah, you know, when you, when you yeah. have like great uh, uh, viola players like Karen Waldock or, or, or cellist like, uh, like Dave. I mean, there is, there is no shortage. But what has stopped me is the practicality of traveling with um seven people yeah because it's uh it's a daunting thing i've played i've had a band with six people when i had three percussionists and i mean it's a gas on stage the yeah, more yeah, the merrier. But... i think it's like yeah. you know like snarky puppy some of the appeal is that there is so many of them and it's fantastic and exciting um but it's a it's a big project yeah financially it's like a yeah <laughs> it's a heavy one <laughs> and also it's like you know there is not many players that can play the kind of music you know that yeah. can swing that can play with also with like african rhythms because they can read anything they actually do really well because they'll read anything no matter how syncopated it is they'll just read it they don't not necessarily feel the groove maybe but uh, you know, with jazz musicians, very often when you play rhythms from world music rhythms, the downbeat is felt in different places. Yeah, sure. in, like in African music, one of the things that attracted me to it is that it is so danceable and funky. That's what I call the record dance. 80% of the music you hear is on the upbeat. Yeah. It's yeah. the opposite. Even in jazz, in jazz, we are like much more syncopated than in classical music. Although, you know, modern classical music is, is different. different yeah. Yeah. Very different. I mean, there yeah. is no accident that Gerg Yulegeti's son became a drummer because yeah, yeah, modern, exactly. yeah. Yeah. you know, modern composers, with Karl Orff it started, they, they, they rediscovered the wealth of material that is just in rhythm. I mean, yeah. when you take Ligeti's piece, it only has three notes. Yeah, yeah, but rhythmically. But yeah. That was crazy crazy hungarian austrian dude but you know actually bob malik you remember bob malik oh i love bob yeah. malik yeah where, where is he now he, by the way oh he's he's happily touring and playing um oh, okay i i i you know i would love to have him again but he used to study with a guy and he would come to rehearsal after studying and he was always like oh my god they said what did he do now and he said he made him play one pitch for an hour oh shit wow Okay. And he said, take a solo with one pitch. And at first I said, that's like sadism. <laughs> I started doing it and I said like, wow, one pitch is not really one pitch because it has so many overtones. And that was kind of the point. And you can bring out the overtones and, and the different ranges are really different people. You know? But it was it was from that school. I, I have, uh, you know, when I first grew up in Germany, there was not really a jazz education. Also, yeah. there was this um, concept that in order to play jazz, you first had to excel at classical music. And, you know, excelling at classical music takes like between five and yeah. ten years or probably a lifetime. So it was not really something that 
um, you know, it, when I first started, I just loved the blues. I wanted to play the blues. I loved Jimi Hendrix. It's like, why mm, do sure. I have to learn all the sonatas and partitas before I get to do that? Sure. And then, you know, in German composition, when you go to music school here and you want to study composition, you have to be pretty good on piano and also pretty good on violin. Mm -hmm. And I was, as a child, I, I had learned classical piano because that was another German rule is that the our Western harmony is best learned on the piano, which actually, you know, now that I'm older, I kind of agree with yeah, it yeah, because yeah. it's one of each. You know, on the guitar, we have five of each. Five, yeah, exactly. And, yeah. and then there is this issue of fingering. You know, my, when I look at Michael's charts, they're full of fingerings, erased, new fingering. With it. Where, where does the guitar sound the sure. best? That's a whole art. And on the piano, well... It's one note you got. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> True. So it makes sense that they make you learn the whole system and you learn modulating, like because it's very visual. You have, oh, we're going to the black keys. That's pretty obvious. That's you know, it's it's a good teaching tool. But at the time I felt like I was a guitar player and nobody recognized that. Mm. I thought I was called to play the guitar. God wants me to be a guitar player. I am only happy when I play guitar. I was very radical young teenager with my guitar i got teased terribly by my brother for it did, did you then, like, they saw the guitar case and said like oh she's here <laughs> random guitar case he said ah oh, yeah there's my sister someplace <laughs> did you so then like learned... listen to hendrix and all these albert king and all these guys and cream and what what was your story that dug you then into jazz actually in an improvisation what was the moment it's actually silly. I don't even want to admit it. But, you know, one thing is like blues and jazz were very popular in Munich because, as you know, the Americans freed us from the Nazis. So everything American was fabulous. <laughs> we were so grateful and so happy. Peanut butter, anything. <laughs> Big cars low to the ground, the best, you know. Uh, so there, and there was an American... Uh, Ba there still is a base, an American military base here, and they had a big band. And mm. a lot of the great American musicians that didn't want to go to war, but had when we had man mandatory military service, they had to go to the army. So they all went to the um, big bands because yeah. the armies had great big bands. The Munich big band has Mel had Mel Waldron as the piano player. Really? I didn't know that. Wow. Mel Walter, okay. was John Coltrane, the piano player in my first grade. He, she was his student. She was good. Wow. <laughs> Jana Shushke, she was badass. She, well, she was Mel's little student, you know. Uh, so we, we had a lot of blues and American influence. The thing that drew me from blues to jazz is was that the jazz, <laughs> it's really silly, I don't even feel like I should say that, but it was that the jazz players took these long solos. And with my knowledge of just pentatonic scales, I ran out of shit to yeah, say. Yeah, sure. No, what you <laughs> and also, you know, in the idiom of, in the traditional blues idiom, the solo is like maybe two courses, maybe yeah. three. In life, maybe, you know, Albert King would like go like crazy or B.B. King would like, you know, play to the audience. But it was basically in jazz that the improvisation really blossomed. And yeah. I really thought improvising was God sent because I spent my whole childhood studying Chopin and Czerny and all these things where you had to play exactly what was on the paper. So when I could make it up myself, I felt like somebody let me out of a cage. Yeah. Exactly. So I really loved improvising and making up my own thing. And and um, and that's what slowly drew me to jazz. Mm. And, you know, Jimi Hendrix himself was very interested in jazz. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah. he was going to play with the Gil Evans Orchestra. And, and, you know, a lot of blues players love jazz and, 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 and incorporate more and yeah. more our ways of improvising that are inspired by bebop and the and the knowledge of harmony and and cadences and all of that. Yeah, like who were the first jazz guys that you encountered actually after Hendrix and all these guys? You know, I love George Benson's first records. Mm. Oh man, you, know, yeah. the, mm. you remember like it's uptown? Yeah, and Giblet Gravy and that stuff, and yeah, 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 yeah. all. 
all of that, I was a huge George Benson fan. And I actually um, bought the guitar that he, he, remember he used to endorse a guitar? Are you familiar with those guitars? Yeah, yeah sure, sure. Yeah. They were like sort of smaller versions of hollow body guitars. Yeah, 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 I know. And, and I love them because a real hollow body guitar, I'm not big enough for a hollow body guitar. It's uncomfortable and it also looks ridiculous. So I had his small one. The only design that I didn't like is that the bridge was not attached to the top. And yeah. he did that on purpose. I actually, lay, while I was playing his guitar, I met him because he was a fan oh. of my husband. And I had just like tried to adjust the bridge myself and I wasn't happy with the result because, you know, I'm not a guitar maker. It's not easy. And, 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 and we discussed the issue of the bridge not being attached to the body because it has its advantages. You can intonate it yourself yep. on the spot, which is what he was doing. But unless you're really good at that, and it's not an easy thing to get good at, yep. especially with a bridge that, um, you know, I can just a bridge that on the electric guitar that has little things I can, you know, I, it's always the G or the D string. I pull it back. I let it a little bit go because every set of strings a little bit different. But we're talking like something like off by a half step if you move the yeah. whole bridge yeah. in the whole. He had individual things, but so I eventually stopped playing the hollow body guitar. And also I had mm. issues with it feeding back all the time. So I went back to an SG and then shortly thereafter I, I I switched to a to a telecaster, but it was not for the love of the sound necessarily. Even so, of course, being a devotee of Jimi Hendrix, I loved the Stratocaster, and I had a Stratocaster with a big headstock, like he did. A <laughs> fair yeah. girl. Um, I my main motivation to get away from the big guitars. I had a three thirty also at some point because I loved that sound. But the same thing, you stuff it with socks yep. with. Everything, exactly. but still, you turn to the drama. Ooh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, exactly. You couldn't really play because it couldn't move. Well, you turn to the bass player. You 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 count in a song. Ooh, <laughs> that's what I said. Like no more. And I investigated all the solid bodies, and I found a way to get the warms that I loved in the acoustic guitars from modifying my amp and playing with the pickups in my guitar so I have like two best friends that have done it to me for, for years and Matt Wells modifies my amps so mm. that they sound warmer and, and have like um you know that they have some of the things I lost when I gave up the, the, the hollow body guitars he put that in my amp as much as you can but I think um I really love the way he helped me shape my sound because it is a very warm sound it is yeah definitely. Uh, He's a he's like a, a you know crazy genius like the guys from Back to the Future you know he'll invent things. <laughs> Guess carefully doesn't catch fire, make it sound really hot and, and and beautiful and and Flip Skidbio and Mark Br Matt Brewster um, helped me with the pickups in my Stratocaster in my Telecaster and what we did is we put Lindy Fraylen stacked. Um, Stratocaster pickups in my Stratocaster. So you have the mm, single okay. coil. I mean, so, you know, some purists will start arguing if you don't leave the original pickup in that is very soft or you put a preamp in to, you know, make it a 21st century guitar so you can play, you know. Yeah, sure. Not just with a distorted sound, but you need a powerful pickup if you want to play with a clean sound. So we did, we used Lindy Fraylen. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He makes pickups. No, we no. used we'll check it. Yeah, he winds his own pickups. And they're stacked hamburgers. So they're on top of each yeah. other. And you get that coil cancelling because otherwise if you play a single coil pickup, you it's noisy. Yeah, and, yeah, of course. Yeah. You yeah. know, in a live situation actually in a live situation it always causes a problem because the um the lighting if it's not really isolated great yeah, in a like club such a hum. Yeah. you get the guitar is is so loud when you play a ballad like everybody is complaining the horn players and... yeah exactly so by stacking the pickups you can avoid you still get hum from every electric guitar you 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 have to 
find a solution for that. But if you have a single call pickup, it's like another dimension. I mean, I remember being with my, I still have a 59 Stratocaster with, oh, wow. that is attached. But when I'm in the studio, very often I stand in a strange position towards my band because, um, because of that hum. Yeah. One, two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I, I know, I know, yeah. It's, uh, but yeah, you I love play the guitar yourself, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The, uh, I, I had the same problems, you, you know, with the strat, and so then I used like the the second position. Right, that's the not second the same. position is fine, but God but, forbid you accidentally hit it, it goes ah. Exactly. So you know, <laughs> but it's not the same sound as a uh, you know the the neck pickup, and it's like ah, but yeah. But the, I like the second position and the fourth position. Yes. They're very expressive. It's yes. as if you put a, a compressor or like, that's like, you know, that's the classic Stratocaster sound. It's a, exactly. it has become, actually it was that split coil sound that I sort of really liked. And you can't get that with a Telecaster. I mean, mm -hmm. you can try, but it's never going to really. It's, yeah. It's, it, some people come pretty close, but I just changed to a Stratocast and I never went back. Yeah, sure. It's like in rock, you know, some players play an SG, some play Strat, and they will not switch. So I, I think once you find the sound and what you like, then I think that's how we are, right? Kind of. Yeah, we are. But, you know, I'm also a little bit like my colleagues in the rock, in the singer-songwriter world. I like different guitars for different sounds. Sure. Um, you know, I used to have a lot of friends in Austin because I had a rhythm section from Austin that I toured as a trio with Brandon Temple and Edwin Livingston. We opened for Steel Pulse on, Steel, on three good, good, big tours. And since the two of them lived in Austin, I would spend a lot of mm. time there. And people there would come on the stage with these guitar racks for four guitars. And they play a different guitar every, every song. And at first, I was like, what the hell is this? And then I saw the point of it because my Telecaster, my 335s, my Stratocaster, they all have different sounds. So yeah. when I'm recording now, I use all my instruments. Oh, okay. Yeah. There's yeah, nothing quite as funky as an Telecaster. So yeah. I I use that. Yeah. I love a Tele also. I have one. I mean, and a 335 yeah. even so a trick for me it's a it's a nice jazz guitar yeah. if you want to play a standard the 335 sounds really good oh i love that sound yeah that's the sound yeah uh i just needed to be a bigger person i'm <laughs> too little for that big guitar <laughs> but it's funny everybody says my husband always says look at Emily Lou harris who plays the biggest acoustic guitar yeah. you barely see her behind it i mean sounds but the sound is yeah yeah, the sound exactly. is incredible. You play an A chord and it's like the sun rising. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I agree. But you know, yeah. with the way I play and the way I improvise, I think eventually I would hurt my hands at playing a guitar that's not... Uh... Because, you know, as jazz musicians, we ask a lot of our hands. Well, definitely, yeah. And, and it, I think it is important to try and play... Um, a comfortable instrument. I I noticed that after I injured my hand, you know. Mm. Yeah, yeah. We're like but actually, I didn't injure it. Uh, yeah. uh, playing guitar, I played. You know, I play an African instrument. It's called ngoni. Yeah, and it is traditionally played with your hand like that, like the old classical technique. It's played, yeah. you know, with a hand and an angle, and. I changed my technique because I hurt my thumb. I had to surgery on my thumb sure. here because this constant, you know, the thumb is in a very bad. Yeah, it's not natural. Position. Yeah, yeah. It's not natural. So I just said, I don't care what they say. I'm going to play it like this. I mean, like a little bit out. Like I took some classical guitar lessons to get some chops with the fingers, and they they have the wrist a little bit away. Yeah. They don't need to tap as much as we electric guitar players do, but but there is something about having the the hand um, in a comfortable position, not do Definitely. something. You know, can you imagine violinists? What kind of oh problems man, I have? always yeah, I'm always shocked. Yeah, I always look at always their shocked. hands like and I say, oh my god, this yes. is gonna invite all kinds of troubles. Yeah. But I now play the goni like this, and then you know, funny. 
six months later, I saw my teacher, Basi Kukuyate, in a concert. And I look at his hand. And, you know, he shifted his hand also. Mm, yeah, yeah. Eventually, it's, it's more comfortable to play, not in the traditional way. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, we're forcing our bodies, you know. I mean, you know, this, the problem is the sound. I got into it very much with a, I took a six months of, no, three months of guitar lessons because we, I traded lessons with the head of the guitar department at Berkeley, who's a classical guitar player, Kim Perla. She's a prodigy, a beautiful classical guitar player, but she wanted to learn how to improvise better because they don't teach classical sure. musicians. Yeah. And she has a duet with David Tronzo. And David is a great improviser. So she just wanted to spend some time just looking at different concepts of improvising. And I said, I need some strength in my fingers for the goni because the goni doesn't sound good with the pick. Also, you get into issues because when you amplify a goni, you have to mute the strings. Mm -hmm. So the pick, it doesn't really work. It works best with the hands. Um, it's almost like you know, the finger, finger picking style, some of the yeah. folk and, and country musicians do, it's more related to that than to the picking that we do. So I needed to find a way to play that instrument um, in a way that doesn't injure my hand and the and, and to also develop some speed and some, you know, some technique. And, and uh, I really enjoyed that. And it really totally fixed my hand yeah. because, you know, there's a lot we can learn from the classical guitar players. We jazz musicians, we always like just say, ah, hell with the technique, let's improvise, you know. But the the next thing you know, you have tendonitis, you know. Exactly. So so there's a lot we can learn from, from classical music. Once I got over uh, my resentment of having to be forced to follow the German regiment of first guitar and violin, then first piano, then violin, and then maybe you can choose your instrument. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's like we had the same system, you know, we were... You do, you have that too? Yeah, 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 I mean, n now it's more loose, but in the past, you know, I guess still from the Habsburg monarchy from the 19th century, it, it was kept, exactly. you know, I don't know, I, like <laughs> this. It's <is> old! <laughs> yeah, that's, it's like, you know, but... Uh, l l Lenny, but I you know you. what, what changed my mind about that too is that I noticed, you know, all these players that come from Cuba and then have the chops of doom. I mean, the piano players, everybody that comes yeah, from yeah, Cuba is crazy. like yeah. ridiculous. But you know what they are training? They're training the Russian classical system. Oh, yeah. Sure. And and even in other places where there is big Russian influence, we played in Angola. There was a Katumbela is a big festival in um, Angola and we invited and they asked us to do a masterclass at the local school. And, you know, I have never seen a musical with so many upright basses, cellos, uh, violas and violins. The oh. Russians brought all of that and these little Angolan, like seven and eight years old, were playing Bach on oh. bass and cello and And they were so, it was one of the best masterclasses we ever did because they were so knowledgeable. You know, there's a lot of things to play, like they knew about uh, legato, they knew about tempos, they knew about piano and pianissimo. You know the famous jazz musician joke, what do you mean that man? I'm playing as loud as I can. You know, <laughs> all of these things that make music beautiful. Yeah, exactly. They had a lot of tools for that. So I think there is a lot to be learned from classical music. Um, and I have probably benefited um, by my classical studies. Um, and the whole problem would have been solved if somebody had let me improvise in the beginning and then, you know, know what you mean. Yep. taught me what the technique can do and how fun it is. And so, so, but, but that's not how in Europe no. we think, you know, jazz was com considered like entertainment music at best. Yep. Also, you know, we have to thank the Europeans for making jazz a legitimate music because when they heard Coltrane and, uh, you know, Miles Davis and all the older generation of jazz musicians, they thought it was exemplary music. Yep. They did not think 
that, but that comes because of the modern composers like Stockhausen and Ligeti, and they were big, big fans of yeah. uh, of jazz. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I mean, what, how was it like for you when you came from Germany, from this rigid, like you mentioned, system to Berkeley? How did you end up in Berkeley in late 70s? And how, how was that like for you? Well, you know, I was an actress as well. And I, like that, I had an in to many film scoring jobs. So I started film scoring. Oh, and I wanted okay. to study film scoring. But you couldn't study film scoring. There was no, now you can at the university. Yeah. They have actually two different courses in film scoring. I looked it up. But before that, you would have to study composition and, you know, learn the piano and the violin. And, uh, I just couldn't, I couldn't do what I do here. And in Berkeley, they had a program that was connected with the film school that was adjacent, actually, a, like a few blocks away. So the, the, the film school students would score the films of the, oh, yeah. of the new cinematographers. So it was a real hands-on thing. So you actually got to write film scores. In Germany here, it wasn't like that. You would be the assistant of a film school writer. And that also happens in America. And yeah. um, they will give you a theme and you have to develop the whole score from that. So you do get that. But until you get a theme that you can develop, you have to spend a few years getting coffee and being like the assistant. Sure. You know how it goes, you know, you like... Uh, distribute the papers to the orchestra that's recording the score, you know, like you're the Notenbart. And exactly, and yeah. and I just didn't have time for that. I was already 28 and I was writing film scores, so I was not in no mood to to be a portrait. <laughs> and this program, it was, they, they offered it as a summer program. So I took a break from acting and I just went for the summer program. And it was fabulous. I really, really loved it. And I loved the liberty and all the possibilities. And also, you know, the thing that blew my mind at Berkeley, I had an orchestra. Mm. Not many string players, but I had all the horn players. I want all the percussionists. I want, because the other students would do their ensemble, their sighting, all their classes would be for us. So that's the way Berkeley was organized. And I thought it was brilliant. And I had, I still had very good points from that program. That program was, I had so much fun that I canceled some work here and I came back to the program. Your homework was you had to do, watch all the Hitchcock films and, uh, and analyze Bernard Herrmann's scores, like Hitchcock, you know, the famous violins and all of that. So, I mean, imagine all the film scoring students smoking pot, watching movies and saying, wow. And <laughs> That's I a mean, nice it was study. The yeah. Best, best study. And then we got to conduct and do our own stuff. We were kind of the, the spoiled people in the whole Berkeley because we got to compose and we had everybody that would have, you know, we could have five cellos play a thing if we wanted to be like Bacchianas Brasileras and imitate uh, the Brazilian great composers, you know. Okay. And so so I really enjoyed it. And also the contrast of the uh, classical German training and the jazz training in, in America. Like I got to study with great, great jazz, jazz musicians, John Laporta, John Damian, Bill Fazell. And my my husband also Mike Stern and and it was I loved it it was fabulous and then also in school you know you played in ensembles and there were between the students there were little groups forming so I put a band together with Claire Daly you probably know her the saxophone yeah, player sure. yeah, yeah. so we had a band and we got the best rhythm section in front of course everybody wanted to play with the girls so we had Bob Galadi and uh, Ruth Getz of this great rhythm section, James, oh. same as Jerry Baganzi. <laughs> and we just played standards in our own composition. So that's my first band was with Claire Daly and we played in the jazz clubs there. And we were very popular. You know, we were a lot pretty young girls. And and I remember our first gig, um the the, the club owner Michael at Michael's had said, like, you know, I hope some people come because I would love to give you guys more work. Um 
but you got to tell your friends that, that they come to the club. So not only did all of our friends come, but some of our teachers came. Mm. And I remember Mick Goodrick came. Oh, wow. And he came in a disguise, but his disguise was so ridiculous. And when he came in, everybody turned around and said, like, who is that fool? He wore like a fat, funny hat to make, to, to, not to scare us. It was very nice intention, but it totally didn't work. <laughs> Because the whole club turned around and said, Oh, there's Mick Goodrick. And I was like, Ah! <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and for me, she says, No. <laughs> that's so that's how it all started. And then, you know, I was still working in television, in, in, in film in Germany. But, you mm. know, that work is usually like concentrated. So I would go for three months and shoot 27 television shows and then come back there. And also, then I got to score some of the television scores because now I was a film scoring person from America. America. And everybody was like, wow, what is that? Um, and then eventually after I met my husband, this going back and forth was was really difficult. And also it was really difficult to become a really good guitar player with so many things cooking. So I just thought I want to take like two years off, have a sabbatical and just really become a good mm. guitarist. And, you know, that two years turned into... 40 years. <laughs> yeah. Every once in a while, I do a movie or a film score. Or, um, I, the funny thing is, I haven't done many film scores because I really enjoyed live playing so much. And, uh, you know, at the time when I went to America, it was 40 years ago, there wasn't a whole lot of rhythm sections in Germany. Mm, and you come yeah. to Berkeley and there's hundreds literally hundreds of good drummers from all over the world. So that's how I really liked it. And I also thought that America was a little bit better in letting women do a men's job. Mm. It comes probably from their pioneer mentality where they couldn't discriminate against women because they needed them. <laughs> so the women always were part of the household in a big way. Yep. Those days in Europe have been long, long, long gone. And 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 women nowadays it's much better. But 40 yeah. years ago it wasn't. When when I said I want to play guitar, everybody was like dying laughing. They thought it was such a funny joke I told. And I mean still in, in America, I get comments like, you play really good. I mean, for a woman, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I love you that. Know? Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> After 40 years and 22 records, it's like, really, for a woman, it's amazing. <laughs> but, that's you know, prejudice die hard. You know? yeah. It's like saying, like, you're very smart for a black person. Really, exceptional. <laughs> Stuff like that, yeah. that's Yeah, it's terrible, yeah. But it's still there, yeah. I mean, especially, yeah. Definitely. Like, uh, I wanted to ask you about one record because I, I, I'm a huge fan of Frizzell and Paul Motion. And, uh, oh, yeah. How did that band happen? And uh, I mean, now when I listen to your music, you know, if someone, they would not maybe associate you with Paul Motion immediately. But like, you know, when I listen to that album, Clairvoy, and, and it makes complete sense. Like, how, how, did, yeah. how, how did that story with Paul begin, actually? And, but Paul really liked playing with the young musicians. So, you know, at the time he also played with Jerry Allen, who was young at the time. And he just, you know, he was very unusual the way he played the drums. Yeah. I mean, and yeah. all the musicians were like thrown by that. But younger musicians thought it was like the coolest shit ever. So I guess we earned Paul because we were open-minded and we mm. were into what he was doing. Whereas everybody else was shocked and sometimes appalled by what he was doing. I mean, people would write things in the New York Times. They said it sounded like somebody threw a drum set down a flight of stairs. Right. You know, that he was an avant-garde drummer. And the younger generation like me, we thought this is the shit, this is it. But in his world, he was very controversial. Less so after he spoke with Keith Jarrett, but, you know, I think the reason he left Keith Jarrett's group is also because it was too, um, too conventional for Mainstreamish him. almost, yeah. yeah. It was too mainstreamish. And he was like a rebel. He was a, um, you know, when you hear his early recordings with other people, um, 
I can't think of it now. Well, there is always the classical people with with Bill Evans. Also, you know, Paul had a little bit of a temper. He walked out on Bill Evans, and he also walked out on um, Keith Jarrett. I don't know what he said something, and he got up and he left, and he never came back. And then he was available. So all us young kids, when we heard that him and Keith were fighting, was like, oh, could we please make him up there? <laughs> was a storm of young musicians and said, yes, he's free. Let's go get him. And, 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 you know, he was happy to play with us. And he was the coolest guy. I remember that as of my best. He would come, not one, but two 18 years old. He had two girlfriends, both 18, long hair down to their ass. And, and my band was like, what is he doing that we don't? <laughs> He was just a bad boy. He was such a bad boy. He was fabulous to work with. Yeah. He was like very aware that it was a nervous wreck. So he would say, I don't know what tempo, count me off. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> at the time Bill was playing, he said, please, 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 please cut, off, cut it off. And Bill said, no, 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 you count it off. It's yours off. <laughs> I remember I was so nervous. My Gums would stick to my teeth. Oh, I. <laughs> yeah. My mouth was dry. I was a complete disaster until I realized that I had never sounded better in my life. And then I said, like, oh, I said, I remember the first night I played with him. I walked away and I said, this is the first time I feel like a real guitar player. Mm. Yeah. Because he listened to me and everything I did, he made it better. It's not like I had to run after him, which, you know, you always have to a little bit, but but his thing was like, he made something out of what I did. And that was genius. And I will forever, ever be grateful for him to have this experience. And then the band started sounding really good and everybody was like digging in. And Bill Frizzell, who was still my teacher, I was still like referring to him or feeling like he was my teacher, even so he wasn't really actually teaching me anymore. We were playing together. Uh, but he was really advising me. He said to me that, because I was shy, he said, you really should play. Mm. And I said, play? How? How is that going to work? And he said, like, every restaurant you go to, there's a guitar duet. Why don't you just ask? And and if you get a gig, we'll, I'll, I'll play with you. Because I was not going to do it. And he said, okay, I play with you. Get, just go and do it. So I did it. Sure enough, we got a gig and we started playing. You I was Bill so duo, surprised. Or... It was a Brazilian restaurant and oh, they wow. loved it. Beautiful. So we play like Maniao de Carnaval. And like a, you know, we played the whole very syncopated, very beautiful repertoire, Jobim. Mm. And, and uh, our own originals. And that's how come then, then sometimes we edit bass and drums through it. But it was part of his teaching to get me to, yeah. you know, there is a lot to playing music than just sitting in your room practicing, you know. Yeah. And and that was really part. He was a, Bill was, is such a, he's such a great teacher, especially more like, you know, in Germany, you have teachers when you just play concerts and they just like discuss that with you. It's a different relationship. And, and, and I had that with Bill. Yeah. Cause then after the show, he would, um, you know, direct it and make suggestions. He said like, you know, when you solo on, maybe start out with your best, like maybe save that, you know, Things yeah. that everybody needs to hear. He had a very cool way of saying that without you feeling bad about what you had done. He yeah. made it fun. He's a very funny guy. Yeah, I mean, I love Bill. I mean, he's yeah. He's a genius. Yeah, oh, I was, he's I a was genius, very, yeah. I was very. Good. Yeah. And then at some point, the band was sounding good, and they said you should make a record. And I was like, it was again like you should. I said like, what do you mean I should make a record? How do I do that? And they said, well, you go and get a record deal. We just record <laughs> we record a demo and then you go get a record. So we recorded a demo and <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't the usual way. The first guy I went to, he gave me a record deal. <laughs> I gave him my demo and I said, I was completely awkward and completely clumsy. Like, I was thinking, and he said, you want a record deal, right? They said, yes, exactly. That's what I want. And he said, hey, let me listen to that. And he said, that's very good. 
for a girl. Very good. <laughs> God, it's, it, it's, it decides me. And then I came back to the bed and I said, okay, you said I should get a record deal, so I got a record deal. Well, we got a record. And then when I completely said, how the did you do that? And I said, well, I just did what you said. <laughs> I was just completely terrified the whole time and I didn't think it was going to work. But it turned mm -hmm. out that, you know, actually, if you have a demo tape with Bill Fussell in promotion, it's not that hard to get a record deal. I have to say that too. But I was uh, unaware of how the record business works and what their priorities were and what, you know, what that it, it there were not many records with Paul Motion yeah, outside of Keepers. And there were not many records with, with Bill Frizzell outside of that. So the guy, Jim Snowden from, from Passport Records, he he thought this was his lucky game. He found like a dumb girl who had the best musician. <laughs> so he hired her and he didn't have to deal with the other guys who would have probably been very difficult and, and made a lot of demands of him. So it was a win-win all around. And we recorded right my first record and and put it out and he liked it so much that he said like why don't you keep doing that it's really good and we had a lot of tunes so we called it a second record wow that's amazing yeah i still i, I love the tunes there like that back out and peter pan i listened to it today and it's a, such a nice record i mean it's, uh, uh, thank you thank yeah, it's you you know beautiful I, record i have to say after i dissed german music education it did not hurt me that they made me do counterpoint twice <laughs> I thought that was child abuse, but it's really very helpful because counterpoint is like practicing scales, but it's practicing compositions. Yeah, exactly. And you get very comp very frustrated as a young musician because the concept of practicing composition is not really, it's actually not presented to you that way. But it really, that's what it is. And I, all of my students now have to learn counterpoint because it's the, the, science of harmony of cadences of tension and resolution um it's it's really Gratus at Parnassum is a genius book and it's still valid today so I had an easy time composing because of that also at the Berkeley at my composition studies I was very popular with my teacher because I had all of that knowledge yeah. It was me and the Russian kids. <laughs> we knew how to write a melody because after you do counterpoint twice, and then I did it a third time. Altogether, I did it four times. Recently, I did it again. It's yeah. just good practice. It is, yeah, it is. yeah. It is good practice. And it's not, you know, jazz was so maligned by classical music that I think we have maligned classical music just out of a hurt feeling because they didn't respect us and they didn't let us in their concert halls and they paid they still pay each other like twenty thousands and they pay us five thousand. So it's a very disproportionate thing. And we've started resenting them because of that. But I think it's a mistake to uh resent to use Messayen, the technique of their musical language, because yeah. that is like hundreds and hundreds of years of experience and practice. So I've gone back and and in my daily practice I incorporate uh, Bach partitas, violin partitas that I play on the guitar. Yeah. Yeah, it's important. Did, did you write that music? I mean, speaking of composition, knowing that Bill and Paul are going to play it, like, or did you? Yes. Yeah, okay. Like it, it sounds very... I wrote the songs yeah. for my band. Okay, yeah, that's important. Yeah. Beautiful, yeah. I mean, I wanted them to be happy. I was <laughs> terrified. I was so glad they were in my band. I really, really put a lot of effort into presenting good material to them. Yeah. I mean, I thought Paul was just going to tear up the thing and start laughing and walk out. That's what he did. To Keith Jarrett. <laughs> so I wasn't about to take any chances. That's beautiful. Yeah. And he was always, always sweet to me. And he was so amused by me being nervous he thought that was the funniest thing in life i mean i'm glad he thought it was funny not annoying yeah exactly yeah because l l later you know i've heard stories like when he was older how he sometimes worked when people called him for a studio session he was like yeah five thousand that's it <laughs> but he the, had a reputation he was never like that with me mm, interesting i had you know hiram bullock produced my record and yeah. he was a pop and rock producer and he came up to promotion i thought i was gonna faint and he said would you mind if i gave you a snare drum and they're like 
shut up, be quiet, don't talk to me. And Paul said, um, I don't know what that is, let me hear it. And so they started messing with snare drum sounds oh, and wow. Paul was okay. totally into it. Because, you know, in jazz, they just set up the jazz kit and put two overhead mics and they don't pay any attention. And I think Paul really liked that this rock and pop producer paid extra attention to the sound of his drums because the sound of his drums is quite extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. And the guy was thinking, like, which mic do I put which mic? And Paul was totally into it. Oh, wow. So, you know, we made a big effort in providing a recording situation that would be joyful for him. Yeah, that's important. You know, but a lot of people were like, you know, they just pissed him off. They would have pissed anybody off. The people that just called him and say, you want to play on my record without anything. You know, they would sure. have pissed off Jack Dijonet just and, Yeah, same. yeah, yeah. It's, this music Jack is personal. I think Jack mean, picked up the phone for that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in, in jazz, it's all about community also and you know, yeah, it is. All, all, Paul yeah. had a little bit of a temper, but you know, listen to him play. Yeah, you know, it's explosive, and it's like that's how he is, and that's yeah. what you want. Exactly. So yeah. you don't want like a, a a sort of meek or like steady or thing. That's not what you want to hear when you have a drummer. It's like, what do you want the guy for? It's not your accountant that has to be reliable. He has yeah, yeah, to. Yeah, exactly. Light a fire under everybody's ass, so you're gonna get a fiery guy, and then you're gonna complain that he's fiery. Exactly. That's yeah. what I think about that. Yeah. yeah. But you know what helped me also that in the acting world there is a lot of leeway for actors to act like they're crazy because they have to act, and it's like they are the instrument. So I was used to dealing with eccentric people. As a matter of fact, I sought them out because in many cases those were the best performers. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. so interesting. Nowadays, we, we, I have a brother who's a music therapist. And like when you see what music does to people with uh, mental difficulties and disabilities, you can see why so many musicians really have some of these aspects in their mind or in their emotions. And the music provides therapy yep. in addition to being their their vocation as a musician but it's also something maybe they are so drawn to it and they have to practice because it provides an emotional relief to yeah. some disorder that they're suffering from yeah i mean my little brother he dealt with schizophrenic and autistic kids they were self-mutilating and you give them a drum and they stop and they were you know it's it's really miraculous what can be done and then you look at us musicians and you say like you know how crazy are we that exactly uh, yeah if if somebody took my guitar away, I wonder what kind of a problematic person I could took into. <laughs> it's not going to happen. No, but it's true. I'm it's true. Stop, I agree. You know? I agree. We're all the same. We're like practicing. Like, right. Yeah, I have to learn this voicing and I have to write this tune and in our own, own little universes sometimes. But it's so Yeah, cool. and also I'm too preoccupied to be like, um, to be difficult. Like, as a, as a wife, I don't really care. I mean, I do care. Of course I care. But what I really care about is how I resolve this voice into the next voice without breaking my wrist. So I'm always very preoccupied. And the other stuff has a different importance for me. My identity doesn't depend on how well my husband likes how I run the house. I mean, I'm glad he's happy. I'm glad he likes my cooking. But it's not... If he didn't, I would just order in. It would not... Sure change the way I feel about myself. Mm. My happiness depends on my relationship with my music and with my instruments, yeah. not with something another person does. Of course, we are all social beings and it, it depends, but um, I think it's a lot of, it's a mistake if you try to make your relationship what defines you. Mm -hmm. And women are a little bit prone to that because of their upbringing. Yeah, definitely. Do, do you oh, and my Mike... raven has. Oh, I, I just wanted to ask you: Do you and Mike like discuss a lot uh, about like voicings or composition? If you have like a tune, how to deal with it? Or... All the time. All the time. All the oh, okay. time. Okay. I'm so glad that he understands that. 
and like a lot of times I've come, I come to him with a problem and I said, there's no way of playing this anywhere on the guitar. And like two days later, he said like, check this out, <laughs> you know? Or he said like, this tune has too many sections. It has no endings. It just goes around and around. And then sometimes something pops into my head that could solve that problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mostly composition, but lately, especially since I play in his band yeah. and I've had to play his book, my my guitar skills are like almost overpassing my compositional skills because I've spent so much time. I had to really spend the last three years and also starting with the pandemic because I could, because I had time. Nobody said, oh, you have to do this, you have to do that. I could just sit in my room and play to my heart's content. But since also since I joined his band, I spent a lot of effort in perfecting my technique and uh, being able to improvise at any tempo. Mm -hmm. um, I was not drawn to these breakneck tempos. I always had like one or two songs like like Rabbit or Hide and Seek. So they were like yep. runners that we play like as fast as you can in E. <laughs> you know, I had like certain things made for that. But his is half that. Yeah. Yeah. His repertoire is very challenging technically. So uh, since that is my main job now, I set time aside to just do that. And and uh, I've ne ne neglected my composition a little bit. <laughs> mm. Interesting. Yeah, oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, that you you you're, you you know it's nice that you can tour together and support each other. I mean, the road can be tough, you know, and. It's good that you're in his band. I think that's a nice thing. And we're having a lot of time. It's like we moved our house into a bus because at home <laughs> we were always playing together every day, all the time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, you should do a duo. Yeah, album, it was always... would be nice to hear you guys, like just two guitars. You know, people have said that. And actually, like, you know, Michael said that, like when we play his songs that I usually played with six or seven people, a couple of times he said, like, said, you know, the song gets a different life when we just play the two of us. Because in his band, a lot of times he does this super cool, like Jamaican thing where you double the bass on the guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's like a ska thing. Yeah. And yeah. I've actually, actually played in one original Jamaican band with a Jamaican producer. And I opened for Steel Pulse for like three years. So I know what that is because that guitar player used to do that. And I got to do that with him. And I was friends with the guitar player, David. He, we used to ask him to come sit in and play some jazz with us because, mm. you know, in, in, in David Heinz band, he didn't get long solos. And in our band, we say like, okay, blues and C, go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 10 minutes later, he's still rocking. <laughs> so I learned that. And now I use that in Michael's band where I double the bass line. So I can play all the parts. Beautiful. that the other guys play. I can play the melody. Of course, you have to learn the melody and I can play the bass parts. And then I have my guitar part, of course. So by jumping in between all the parts, we can actually play his music as a duet. And he was happy with it. So I think maybe yeah. we should re-record some of his, like, oh, you man. know, chromosome. Chromosome like, is crazy. a duo. Ooh, I would love that. No, I'm not in a duo. Ah! That would be... yeah, that's... I, I usually teach this tune to my students and they're always like what it's like oh, I, I love that tune uh, yeah beautiful it's a great tune you know one time we went to hear uh, Lila Hathaway sing and we yeah. went backstage to congratulate and she came up to Michael and she said I think it's in chromosome and he said you cannot and she started singing it oh wow yeah it's a beautiful it's beautiful. one of his famous songs it's a great song yeah, yeah. He has done many. I mean, I, I, I always teach Little Shoes, if you remember that one. Yes. Like, I don't know. I just love that melody. And his solo. <laughs> that, <laughs> it's so melodic, you know, and it's like every kid who... Uh, he writes some pretty melodies. Yeah, and it's they're so catchy. And, you know, students, they're like 12 or 13. I just give them to them and they're like, oh, man, this is cool, you know. And they're playing jazz or fusion, not even knowing, like, okay. Yeah, so, yeah. So that's it's, it's great. Beautiful. Yeah, he has many, many very, very beautiful melodies. I love playing his music. It's such great music, Absolutely. great compositions. Yeah. And actually now, you know, I get to play with Dennis and Lincoln again. That used to be my old band. Yeah, exactly. Before yeah. they deserted me and went to Michael and I got Don Elias, which I'm not sorry. Oh, <laughs> Don yeah. Elias and Tim Lefebvre was a very nice band. <laughs> One of the greats, yeah. 
some of the great yeah. beautiful uh all right lenny i wanted to ask you just uh i mean i think we'll have lunch upstairs but like what are the plans for this year uh for the reminder uh, you said you're going on the road again and uh I, we're going on the road to china japan argentina brazil all over europe awesome. all over america and in between i'm gonna try to record some singles and uh and um, perform with my band. Fantastic! Yeah. Well, you should bring your band to Europe for small for a tour, if possible. That would be beautiful soon. Yeah, I, I, I'm planning to do that. I'm waiting to see what my touring schedule with Michael uh, looks like. This year seems super, super busy. But um, if not this year, the next year, I'll definitely come to Europe with my band. I would love to come to Slovenia. Some of the promoters have asked. If I would bring my my African project, um, yeah, it would be great to see you. Yeah, definitely. it would be wonderful. Yeah. So Where in Slovenia are you? I'm in Maribor, which is like half an hour south of Graz in Austria. Just that oh, you get it. Oh, very close. Maybe we would come. We could come play in Maribor. We play in Graz in Vienna. Yeah, I mean Vienna. You know, you can do Porgy and Bess, and in Graz there are some places you could do and. Uh, Maribor has one venue. Uh, let, let me know when you're planning a tour. I can send you a link of one guy. Maybe he he could uh, he would love to have. Yeah, we could. Do that. We'll do like you know. I was I was my my plan is to do two week long tours with my band. Not long, just that's, quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's otherwise too long. Yeah, it's two weeks is a lot already <laughs> to be on the road. I mean, it's, it is a lot. Yeah, and band leading and everything. But yeah, super. Right. And it's it's actually like kind of nice to do like a week long tour and then come back and play in New York and then exactly, yeah, beautiful. Uh, Lenny, thanks so much for sharing some of these thoughts. I'll I'll leave you a nice uh, Sunday, yeah, afternoon in Munich. So have and, a uh, great lunch. Yes, we will, <laughs> and uh, I hope to catch you live so uh, on the road somewhere. And uh, same have... for you. I'd love to hear your music somewhere. I'll send you a link or two. So definitely. please do. I Please will. do. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Ciao. Mm -hmm.